Hello everybody. Hey, we're here today doing another video, but today we're doing a little bit of a break from MAM. Doing a little video here about somebody who I think may be wrongfully convicted. A um, gentleman by the name of Scott Davis. Uh, he's currently incarcerated in, in, Atlanta, in Georgia. Um, essentially, the he... I mean, there's some problems with this case, but I'll give you kind of a brief rundown of the storyline here real quick. Um, what happened is back in 96, 97, there was an incident where um, uh, a, a gentleman, Mr. David Coffin, Coffin um, was, was murdered and his house was burned uh, with him in it. And the same night, Scott Davis had an incident at his house where somebody tried to enter his house um, while he was upstairs and when he came downstairs he noticed that his back patio and doors and stuff on the in the backyard were on fire and he so basically his house was uh, began to get set on fire and he ended up chasing a perp who they exchanged some gunfire or whatever but the perp hopped over a wall and got away okay so this is what happened it was on the same night this all happens these these two incidents now there's some other little things that happened too. That earlier that day, um, Scott Davis had been attacked by a guy in public somewhere, you know, or whatever, or at his house or when he came home and the guy was in his driveway or some such thing like that. But he was he had an altercation. Somebody came, you know, brought an altercation to him earlier that day. Uh, so, and they were wearing a mask. So it's you know, anyways. So there's this this thing happens. Anyways, what happens is is that they they aren't able to come up with any real um, connections for with Scott. Um, they they don't certainly don't have enough evidence to prove that he did anything to murder uh, David Coffin, and so they drop the charges. They drop the charges in like '98. So you know, okay. So then Scott goes on with his life. He actually moves to California. He's doing well for himself. And then suddenly, you know, Georgia decides that they're going to pursue this again. Um, and then they bring him back to Georgia. They put him on trial. And they end up they end up getting a conviction. They ended up, you know, putting him in prison. There's some issues with this case. I mean, I'll tell you. There's I mean, I'm I've I've started reading the transcripts. So I'm not I'm not done reading the transcripts, but I've I've read a, a huge portion of the beginning of the transcripts here, and I've watched the 48 hours special on this case, and I've you know been talking to some people about this case, and there is just some really really disturbing things in this case. I mean things that I like I just haven't never seen before, um, or that I've seen before, but just not in so gross amounts of it you know usually you see little mistakes or something but you don't see a lot of mistakes but in this one there's just a lot of mistakes it's crazy so we'll go through it one by one here um but we'll start out with the fact that the the huge chunk of the basically the first hundred pages almost are the direct examination and and cross examination and redirects and recrosses and everything of the co-lead detective in this case. The reason why it goes on for so long is because he's the co-lead detective and as the co-lead detective as the defense attorney Mr. Morris who who is uh, Scott's lawyer Mr. Morris points out to him that as the lead, as a lead investigator it is is part of his responsibility to make sure that the evidence is preserved and makes it to trial um, and, and points this out to, you know, Mr. Chambers, but, you know, Mr. Chambers just keeps saying, well, yeah, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. Now you might be asking yourself, well, how many pieces of evidence went missing? I mean, come on, really? 72. Yeah, I know. 72. 72 pieces of evidence went missing, right? Okay. I, I realize it's 10 years, but you know what? If if you came to prosecute this case 10 years later and you went looking for all the evidence and found out that 72 pieces of it were gone, maybe you should have rethought what you were doing there. Um, I mean, really, completely unfair. Because you guys tested it all back in, like, whatever, 98 and, you know, whatever, when this was all going down. You guys sent it all off to the crime lab and got results and whatever. And we'll get into some of those results here uh, in this video. But then you, you, you go ahead and 
lose all that stuff so that when you come back 10 years later to try him for this, his lawyers have no chance to test that stuff and verify or dispute or anything. So talk about dirty pool. I mean, dirty, dirty, dirty pool. Just unfair completely. So we're going to move into the fact that right here, we move, we'll move into the fact that Chambers, he's asking Mr. Morris is, is, inter, is uh, cross-examining uh, Mr. Chambers. And he's asking him about some uh, prints and some lifts and some pieces of evidence that, that, that he that it shows that he turned him into the the Georgia crime lad and and he and then Mr. Morris is asking him what happened to these pieces of evidence and I think you'll find Mr. Morris's answers wholly unsatisfying as I did Rick Chambers okay do you see the state stamp about three quarters down zero zero nine oh two about two inches from the bottom right hand corner yes we are on the same page, right? This appears to be a receipt of evidence turned into the Georgia State Georgia Crime Lab by Detective Rick Chambers, right? The date is twelve three or twelve thirteen ninety six, right? The first item is tape lifts from the driver's floor, right? Where are those tape lifts, sir? I would think that they are with the Georgia State Crime Lab. Have you made any efforts to find them? No, sir. We have asked for all evidence in this case. And that is, and that has not been turned over. Do you have any explanation for that? I have no idea where it's at. No, sir. <clears throat> the second item is a tape lift of hair. Do you know where that is? No, sir. And that's the way it goes with Chambers, pretty much all throughout this, you know, through the questioning. It's just, you know, do you know where these things are? Did you make any attempts to find out about them at all or anything? You know, it's just on and on and, and with all this various pieces of evidence and he just has no answer for it. Okay, so in this next uh, set, of, set of transcripts or documents I'm going to show you here, it's going to be them, it's going to be basically Mr. Morris asking Mr. Chambers, uh, Officer Chambers, about his statements in, in his affidavit to get a wiretap on Scott Davis to wiretap his offices when he was here in California. Um, the affidavit stated that uh, they uh, their a Beretta 9mm was the murder weapon. And, and, and Chambers wrote the affidavit. And what, more, what uh, Mr. Morris proceeds to do here is he proceeds to kind of pursue the, pin him down on it because Mr. Morris knows something. So he knows it's not true. Um, so what happens is, is, is he, he, you know, basically ends up asserting that, well, you know, I, I believe that the Beretta was the murder weapon and, and, and not, you know, the, he, he tried to like kind of assert that the crime lab had, had said that. And, and Mr. Morris just goes, wait a second. No, 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 no. What did the crime lab say? So it goes through that. Now, the reason why he says, he says, I think it's the murder weapon because number one, it was stolen a week before. Apparently, I'm thinking it may have been misplaced, um, but maybe it was stolen. It's fine. Um, and the and it was and it was found under his head. This is his reasoning. His reasoning that the gun was found underneath David Coffin's head means it was the murder weapon. How is that? I mean, I sit there and I think about that for a second. And I go, somebody came and murdered him and shot him. And somehow he, he, somehow he fell on the gun. How, how did that happen? I mean, uh, the, that sequence of events is interesting to say the least. I mean, what, I, I don't know. I don't understand how that happened. You know how that most likely happens? That type of thing happens. Suicide, I would think, because you would you would you would have the the gun right next to you, and therefore it could fall on it. Not saying that it's not even saying that it's highly possible then, but just the fact that the gun is under his head makes me suspicious. And here it is convincing Officer Chambers that it that it's murder, and it it's actually it actually just gives me more reason for doubt. So uh, that's just strange to me that that the, that that gun was underneath his head. 
I don't know. <laughs> Feel free to let me know in comments if you agree with me. But anyways, the, it, I mean, it almost makes more sense to me that, that this was the, you know, whether or not, I, you know, I'm not saying he, he, he committed suicide. He could have been fighting with somebody. He could have been fighting for his life. He could have found his Beretta that he thought was stolen, but maybe it just got misplaced and he had found it. And, you know, and maybe he was using it for protection that night. That's plausible. That's, that's, I could see that totally. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know how that Beretta ended up there, but the fact that it ended up under his head is just highly strange to me. So we're going to go ahead and move into these documents here. And you can see, uh, you know, Mr. Chambers getting pinned down by Mr. Morris. The first part of 1997, we spoke to them about the Beretta and the fact that it couldn't be test fired, but the rounds were consistent with being fired from a Beretta. Question, and then Morris says, or another kind of 9mm. Answer, you know, and then Chambers answers, yes, a Taurus. A Taurus and a Beretta are just about interchangeable. What is a Ruger? It's a 9mm, or it, it is a make of or brand of, an, of a weapon. The crime lab said it could, it could come from a Ruger, a Beretta, or a Taurus. That's what the crime lab said. Yes. You don't know if the evidence we have discussed here was destroyed, do you? I do not know, sir. Same story with him over and over. I don't know. I don't know what happened. And, you know, he's a lead investigator, so. <laughs> but anyways, we'll move on to now uh, a little bit further into this same subject. In fact, you were the individual who signed the affidavit that was submitted to obtain the authority to do the wiretap, correct? That is correct. In your affidavit, you represented that a Beretta 9mm, which belonged to the victim, David Coffin, was found at the crime scene. <clears throat> that is correct. And you stated that it, it was subsequently determined that this firearm was the murder weapon. That's correct. What evidence do you have that it was the murder weapon? The fact that it was on the scene, the fact that the crime lab said that Mr. Coffin had killed, had been, was killed possibly by a 9mm round. There was a Beretta 9mm found on the scene. The one, that, the one that was taken in the burglary from his home on Saturday the previous weekend. The affidavit doesn't say possibly killed by a Beretta. If you take the evidence and the weapon was found where Mr. Coffin's head was, Mr. Coffin dying from a gunshot wound to the head, the crime lab saying that the bullet could have come from a Beretta 9mm, they didn't say that it was. I believe Ray Charles could have seen it was that 9mm. The crime lab didn't say that, did they? This is when Miss Ross for the prosecution says objection, asked and answered, and relevance, since they abandoned this particular issue on the wiretap. Mr. Morris, it goes to credibility. Court, proceed. Objection overruled. <laughs> she was trying to protect Mr. Chambers there from looking like a fool because that's the way he's going to look here. The crime lab did not tell you that the Beretta you found at the scene and turned into them was the murder weapon, did they? No, sir, they didn't. You just concluded that all on your own. Based on the evidence, he says. Based on the evidence? Yes, sir. But you couldn't compare the bullet to the gun. No, sir, because the gun was too badly burned. So you decided on your own that that was based on the evidence. That you have just explained to us. Any other evidence? Okay, so you see right there that, I mean, Chambers is being pretty pretty kind of obviously dishonest you know i mean morris has to basically i mean he i'll put it this way miss ross actually objects because she's trying to stop what mr morris is about to do because she realizes that that chambers should not have said that she's realizing it and she's just she tries to object to stop it but you know, Mr. Morris just says, I think it speaks to credibility, or I think it speaks to character. And the judge was like, okay, yeah, objection overruled. And and then Morris, you know, Mr. Morris gets to go ahead and pin Officer Chambers down on that point. Um, basically making him admit that the crime lab did not say that. 
that he was basing that solely on his own opinion and his own, you know, evidence, as he called it. So I just thought that was interesting and shows kind of obviously the 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 streak of dishonesty that that is in Officer Chambers. And I will go on to point out one other thing. There's also another thing with this case that they when they interrogated Scott it's been it's been pretty much confirmed at this point that they were stopping the tape at certain points there is missing segments of the interrogation of Scott Davis um i mean it's crazy it's somebody noticed that they they heard the sound of like a tape stopping because they actually used a a tape recorder um back in 98, 96, 97, whatever it was, they actually used an actual real, you know, analog tape recorder. Anyway, so somebody was able to pick up on the fact that they they heard the click of the sound of an analog tape being stopped and played again, or stopped and started again. So, um, and it's been, like I said, confirmed. So there's that level of dishonesty too. They were dishonesting, they were not completely forthright in their interrogation method. So, you know, it's just more things, just more things that stick out in this case that are just odd and, you know, you can't help but wonder why. Why is it why is it happening? So, <clears throat> Detective Chambers, how many cases have you handled in your career with the Atlanta Police Department? Hundreds. And in the hundreds of cases that you have handled as a detective in the Atlanta Police Department, have you ever picked up a phone to the Georgia Crime Lab and said, Hey, Georgia Crime Lab, please don't destroy my evidence. No, ma'am, I haven't. Why not? It's understood that they will not destroy evidence until they are notified to do so by us. And what is, and what is the standard operating procedure between the Georgia Bureau of Investigation and the Atlanta Police Department? Once the, Georgia, once the Georgia Bureau of Investigation has completed their testing of your evidence, that it is to be sent back to the Atlanta Police Department property section to be preserved as evidence. So here's my issue. Hundreds of cases, uh, Detective Chambers? Really? And you've never had to do this before, you say, right? Well, then that would suggest that this has never happened to you before. Which would suggest that this is not a common thing that happens. So how did it happen that 72 pieces of evidence went missing? That's my question to you, Detective Chambers. Okay, so now we're going to move into where they talk about some DNA swabs and some other evidence here. And, and we're going to find out that the DNA swabs were tested. And we're going to find out what the results are. And we're going to find out that, in my opinion, Chambers drops the ball again. I mean, seriously, when it gets to the point where you've dropped the ball so many times, I, it's hard to believe it's accidental. It's hard to believe that it wasn't purposeful. But, anyways, we'll go ahead and move into this document here where we'll see him, um, we'll see him talking about these DNA swabs and, and, and his answers uh, as to them having gone missing. So, here we go. To follow along, 1129 is the Bates stamp number. I'm going to show you the State's Exhibit, exhibit 5, an eight-page document, and refer to page 7 and see that refre see that refreshes your rec see if that refre refreshes your re recollection on what you requested to be done to the swabbings and what is in fact done the samples to be kept for fu for future serological or dna analysis and you did ask that to be done yes and the crime lab did do it yes and we have the results of those tests today due to the crime lab reports yes so there's some evidence that Chambers did actually ask for it to be preserved, but the thing is that the crime lab actually tests it and sends it back to Atlanta PD. So The crime lab report that you just looked at, States Exhibit 5, establishes that the DNA is not Scott Davis, correct? Well, it's consistent with 8, 11, and 42 is Scott. Those were items taken from his sheets, right? And that... And that's and that's what and that's what she was discussing in the items, at the, 
So which items do you want me to discuss? I thought we were I thought you were asking me about the items she asked me about. I'm asking about items that were negative as to Scott Davis. There are items negative to Scott Davis. Whose DNA was it if it wasn't Scott Davis's? It doesn't say, does it? No, sir. And did you ask for it to be tested to find out who it was? Not at that time, sir. You could do that now if it still existed, couldn't you? Yes, sir. So there you go. The one thing that could have pointed at the actual person that did this, the one thing that could have led to a, a real suspect, they buried and lost or destroyed. But certainly buried because he could have had it tested to find out maybe who he should have really been going after. But he didn't want to do that. He wasn't interested in that. So, that, that pretty much wraps it up for today, folks. Uh, Scott Davis, possible wrongful conviction. But I'll tell you what, even if it's not a wrongful conviction, and, and say let's just hypothetically say Scott Davis is guilty, I still have serious criminal justice issues with this case. Huge. I mean, I'm huge, huge, huge. So, that's all I have to say about that. So, hey, we'll see you guys later. If you haven't already, hit subscribe, and we'll talk to you later.